really my great pleasure uh, to introduce the R&D Strategies and Trends panel, which is made up of incredibly esteemed and respected heads of R&D. The main, uh, and I'm not sure exactly the word Stelio shoes for your role, uh, Andy, but they were certainly impressive. I can only echo the sentiment and say, great job to you and Karun on the summit. It's been outstanding. Joining Andy on the panel are Dave Reese from Amgen, John Reed from Sanofi, and Matai Mamam from j and &J. And moderating the panel is the infamous and insightful Martin Mackay. Martin, it's all yours. Thank you as ever, uh, Deval. It's truly my honor once again to chair this panel and with four really great leaders. I'm not going to introduce these guys. They need no introduction. I'll, I'll mention their names uh, briefly, as, as you did, Deval. Uh, we have the old hands on the panel, Andy and Matai, uh, at Takeda and j, j respectively. And they know the, the form here and what they may expect over the next 40 minutes so of tough questioning. And then I'm delighted that uh, David Reese is, this is his second outing. As I mentioned to David earlier this morning, once Karun gets you twice, that's you for life. So you can expect to see Dave uh, on this panel for a few years to come. And then we have a rookie, uh, not a rookie in terms of R&D head, in uh, John Reed, but this is John's first outing. So no pressure, John, you're with some uh, great people. John and I actually met almost 30 years ago. And I'm gonna come back to that in a particular question that I have for the panel around neurodegeneration. But thrilled as ever, I'm not gonna introduce these guys. I'm not gonna ask for opening comments, but rather we're gonna get straight down to the questions. We also have a couple of questioners uh, on hand, uh, Dr. Uh, Pooja Sharma and Dr. Karen Reeves, who will be joining us to ask their particular question. So with that, here we go. My first question was really uh, raised by David Reese in a discussion that many of us had a few weeks ago. And it revolves around this notion of with capital flowing into life sciences like never before, and seemingly endless opportunities for investment, how do heads of R&D make that trade-off between those opportunities and perhaps technological obsolescence as more and more technologies come into play? And as David summed it up, there's a really interesting juxtaposition between golden age for patients, but perhaps more difficulties within company and, and the investment community. So with that, I'm going to start with you, um, David. Could you um, uh, uh, have a first go at that before I go around the other panelists? What's your view? Sure, thanks, Martin, uh, and uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, this was a, a question on one of the polls a little earlier, uh, and the majority of respondents were moderately concerned. I, I, I would put myself in the um, you know more significantly concerned camp here. Uh, for the reasons you outlined, we've seen you know, what we like to call a hyperabundance of capital uh, flow into the sector. That's been, you know, it's fueled new company formation at a pace that, that we really haven't seen uh, ever in the industry. Uh, and all of that, of course, is being propelled by technical advances, technology moving along uh, as, you know, coupled with a fundamental understanding of biology uh, that is deepening. Now, the challenge there is that uh, I think a, a couple fold. Number one, if an interesting target arises, immediately there are many players attempting to prosecute that target. That's great for patients because they are likely to see then uh, the optimal modality uh, or optimal drug. Uh, but how does one think about generating a return on investment when there are so many players on an individual target? Uh, and then the second factor is one that you uh, mentioned and it's one that I think a lot, uh, a lot about, which is the notion of technological obsolescence. Uh, it used to be that, you know, for a fair amount uh, of the patent life uh, of a molecule, uh, one would have, uh, you know, a reasonable market. You know, now 
One may be there with a what's a first in class and best in class drug, but three years later, uh, it may be uh, and also ran because something better uh, has come along. How do we think about managing a portfolio in that setting? And, you know, and to me, it, it just goes back to the basics, which is where do you think you can really bring something innovative to the field that's going to make a difference for patients uh, and for physicians uh, and where you think you have potentially insights uh, that others may not have. Is there a competitive advantage? And then balancing uh, across a portfolio uh, all of those mixtures of investments that, that allow you to generate a return that allows us to continue what we want to continue to do. But, you know, I, I view this as a fundamental challenge going forward. And I'm certainly interested in my co-panelists' points of view here. Thank you, Dave. Uh, John? Yeah, the, uh, the, the pace of uh, innovation is really exciting. And as uh, pointed out, Martin, there's plenty of money to uh, fuel it right now. Um, you know, I, I don't know that uh, any of us have incredible, you know, the, the great answers to this other than I think we, we have to try to stay as best we can on the cutting edge of this. As David said, I, I think really try to use our insights on uh, patients and and, and clinical context to really define where the molecules and the modalities can best play and, and try to use that, at, leverage that as a, as a core competency of uh, companies like uh, Sanofi and other large pharmas, uh, which, you know, maybe is, uh, you know, a, a perspective that's less, uh, less mature at many small biotechs, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it's it's great for patients, as pointed out, because um, there, there's almost any idea that's even half decent, and maybe some that aren't even half decent, maybe a quarter decent, can get funding these days, which is very different than when we first met Martin, <laughs> as, you're, as you're recalling, uh, our foray into new in neurogeneration chasing apoptosis targets. But the, um, uh, but uh, you know, on, uh, you know, and I think it creates challenges for us in large pharma because um, the flight of talent, uh, you know, so many of our best and brightest are finding it quite attractive to uh, to move to where the grass looks greener in some of these well-funded uh, startups. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's both the best of times and the worst of times, I guess, in terms of some of those elements. No, great, great points, John. Uh, Matai, you know, Jane, Jay, you've always pushed this innovation agenda. What are your thoughts? Uh, you're on. You're Sorry on about that. There are okay. obviously challenges and a, and a couple of them have been highlighted here. Um, but I see definitely more opportunity even for larger pharmaceutical companies. It just requires a few things of us. Um, you know, as John said, we've just got to uh, got to do better. We've got to stay agile. Um, you know, there was a time you, you refer to technological obsolescence. There was a time where um, how uh, a piece of innovation, a molecule, kind of slotted into an organization was um, understandable. You know, it was very straight. It was a it was a straight path, and you would work on process development. There were stages you went through. And there was a comfort of what the future would look like, uh, whether it was manufacturing or commercialization. Um, now there's not that comfort, but uh, I tell you that's the real world and that's the world in which uh, most of the smaller company ecosystem exists anyway. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty and ambiguity. So it's, it's up to all of us to just get accustomed to that. Um, and it's a good thing only in that, um, you know, right now there's more, there's going to be more choice that we have to become expert at using. So it's like, it's like trying to think of the right analogy. It's like if you cook and you only have potatoes, it's, it's fairly non-stressful to imagine like maybe how you go forward eating. Uh, and now you have to like be able to use chicken and cauliflower. And so it is, it is, uh, it is more challenging, but once, when, once the system gets revved up, I'm convinced um, even with that large tool set, as we become accustomed to man manufacturing RNA or cells or small molecules with an equal ease, um, we will find it a really good thing at the end. We'll, we'll eat yes. better. Very good, Matai. So Andy, um, and just for the audience, Andy asked me recently if biotech existed when I was a boy. And um, 
very humorous as ever. And of course, I pointed out that biotech is the oldest science probably ever um, in, in relation to the Egyptians and the Greeks. And although I don't go back quite that far, Andy, but as I think about Takeda and your role, I, I, would, I don't know anybody that's done more deals in the innovation space and with partners and creative ways of partnering with this influx of capital. How do you view that world? Well, firstly, I have to reflect on Matai's metaphor to, uh, to food. And actually, Matai gave me an idea because I was unsure what I was going to have for dinner tonight. But now I'm going to have chicken, potato, and cauliflower. So thank you very much. <laughs> But in all seriousness, Martin, we have done many deals and, you know, some have not been so great and some have been fantastic. Um, I think our focus has been to create a culture of partnership, which includes having an outstanding internal laboratory, as good as any laboratory I've been in or seen across the industry, but one that understands the value of partnership. And part of that requires building win-win relationships. You know, certainly as a large biopharmaceutical company, the more that we can do to enable our partners and not try to suck as much out of them, the better off we're going to be. And then the other piece is we've been quite effective at aligning at all levels in the organization to our CEO, to our CFO, to our board, to ensure that we're committing spend in research-based partnerships, because that's where the greatest value comes. As soon as you start to work into late development or into the market, you're paying top value, especially in today's market. So I actually love the fact that there's capital infusion into the biotech space because it means more innovation and more choice. And if there's, if there's an overflux, then we've seen these pendulums swing, they'll swing back. So I think having more capital in, in a business that's driven by um, stoichiometry at some level, there is a little bit of luck to what we do, even though the science is progressing, I think having more going on is, is better for all of us. Yeah, it makes great sense, Andy. I remember working out once that even in a very large pharmaceutical company with a massive budget, we actually had less than 0.01% of the life sciences budget of the world. And how could you possibly develop everything internally and not get access to that innovation? So I think uh, all your answers were terrific. I'm going to kind of come a little uh, lower in the stratosphere now and ask about um, precision medicine and rare disease. And this is something I know, Matai, you've thought a lot about, and particularly how data science impacts working in these spaces. And maybe you could just expound on that for the, for the audience before I call on the other panelists. Sure, Martin. I, and you have an entire panel on this, I think, uh, coming up next which I, I think everyone should watch and, and pay attention to. I do think that there are a whole bunch of innovations, right? From uh, an advanced in, advance in understanding a new biology and advance in a, in a modality. But um, my belief is that it's various aspects of data science and different manifestations that are, you know, together, it constitutes the biggest change. And part of it is challenging because it does involve a culture change within our organizations. And we've been at it, a number of my colleagues on the panel have been at it for a while. And it's challenging. It's challenging at many levels within, within the teams, uh, at the various interfaces with regulators. Um, but, you know, for me, like it, it's, it's, it impacts um, how we're currently picking targets. Uh, it, it certainly impacts um, uh, or will impact, I believe, and we're early days for how to prosecute and invent molecules. Um, and the, 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 some of the newer approaches there of using images or generative algorithms, I'm convinced that they're going to work out. Um, and then I think it is currently impacting all sorts of aspects of how you define a patient. Um, and this is, this is interesting and important because, you know, we're heading towards more precise connection between our biological mechanism and however we're defining a disease. But however we're defining a disease, if it's not traditional, like if it's not uh, kind of an everyday thing, it's very challenging to define a patient in a mechanistic way. So we've been, we've been working on various ways of, um, of taking ordinary measurements and applying an algorithm on top of them to pull back what might be a precise measurement. Like as a quick example of that, just to illustrate what I mean is, 
um, everyone that has cancer gets, uh, if they can get a biopsy, gets a biopsy. And that is typically made into a slide and, and histopathology and various things are done. Um, but it's still unusual, at least in most, uh, most of the world, to get uh, whole genome sequencing of that tumor. That's a less usual thing today. In major academic medical centers, yes. So one of the things that our team has done is work on an algorithm uh, through enough training sets where you can pull back from those images what a mutation is that is mm -hmm. in that tumor. And so it's just making practical uh, and, and, and it's a massive impact for patients by connecting a drug to uh, a patient. It makes very practical and efficient and good for everybody if you can apply um, data science that way. And then there's no shortage. I can go on and on about uh, system trials and real world evidence, which is kind of a component within data science. But, um, you know, big picture is we have to just get accustomed to, to picking problems in the right way where there is suitable data and the problem is important. And we have to get accustomed to kind of the culture changes within our organization to make it all happen. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Matai, how do you think about that at Amgen Day? Yeah, uh, those are terrific examples by Matai. You know, perhaps I'll broaden the perspective a little. You know, one of my core beliefs is that, you know, this industry will, you know, the underpinning of it for the next probably three, four, five decades will be what we're now calling human data. Uh, and by human data, we mean everything from genomics, other omic technologies, to clinical trials data to real world evidence. And the aggregation uh, and integration uh, and then ultimately and most importantly, the analysis uh, of that data, I think is what's going to drive not only drug discovery, but the entire development spectrum. Uh, and so we've created a unit called human data that's really tasked with putting this all together. Of course, we have decode genetics, uh, which forms a core uh, of what I'm talking about with a tremendous analytic engine. Uh, I can't overemphasize how important that last piece is uh, because in you know, 10 or 15 years, uh, a huge amount of data is going to be available in the public domain. Uh, making sense of it will be uh, the challenge. So I think this sort of holistic view and thinking about the use of human data across the entire drug discovery and development spectrum uh, will be one of the primary drivers. And so we're bending a lot of our efforts to build that capacity. Yeah, it makes, uh, makes good sense, David. Any disagreement, Andy? Well, no, I, I love the way David's framing this. And I've kind of taken a mindset where, you know, today the great value in what we bring to patients is the molecule. And the data are an adjacency to the model, but a necessity. At some point, whether it's 5, 10, 20, or 50 years from now, it's going to flip. And the, the value proposition in medicine will be data, not molecules. Of course, there will always be a need for new molecules. But I think what we'll have is we'll have a panoply of effective molecules. And we'll need more data. And at some point, our business model changes. You know, why is it that the, the companies that have trillions of dollars, there aren't, there aren't no pharmaceutical company across the world has a valuation, I think, greater than 400 billion. I know, Matai, you guys have a massive number that I can't, can't even begin to compute, but it's not anywhere near what the tech companies have. It's probably 10%, you know, 10 to 20% of what some of the tech companies have. And those are data companies. Why aren't they jumping in head first? Because today we're still a molecule risk based business. At some point we transition, and I agree fully with David, it's going to be a data-driven company. And only the, the, the top 10 organizations today won't be the top 10 organizations in our industry in 10 or 20 years, because you'll have to be a data-driven company. Yeah, no, it makes good sense. I'm going to change tack here before bringing in a couple of our questioners. I'm going to start with you, John. I alluded to the fact that we met almost 30 years ago, and this was when John was actually at the Burnham Institute in uh, San Diego and had founded a company called Idun Pharmaceuticals. I was working in Switzerland at the time with Siba Geige in the uh, neurodegeneration group or neuroscience as it was called in those days. 
and we formed this partnership to see if we could apply some of the knowledge around programmed cell death to neurodegeneration. Interestingly, there was another uh, part of that collaboration that was with the oncology group that you will remember, John, and that was, you know, the opposite end of it. But the question really is, here we are almost 30 years on, and we haven't really served our patients well in, in neurodegeneration. And I'm not alluding to the recent, you know, controversy over the uh, uh, recent approval. But where do you stand on it now, John? And at Sanofi, what are you doing to try and redress that balance? Well, maybe I'll first uh, just digress a second to say, at least with the oncology effort, uh, that was the foundation that led to the drug Benitoclax, the BCL2 yeah. inhibitor. And it took, a, you know, quite a few different tries and finally partnering with uh, what was then called Abbott, where Steve Fezzik had that SAR by NMR technology, the chemical fragment structure-based approach that finally, you know, laid the groundwork and then uh, ultimately to the, uh, to the medicine. But um, with that digression aside, uh, you know, I, I, I think neurodegeneration remains uh, a very challenging area. Uh, it seems to be an area where we, our, our fundamental understanding of the science is still quite rudimentary. Um, you know, we, we, we continue to see disappointment after disappointment, the aducanumab story notwithstanding. Um, and so, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I think it's one that uh, really would benefit from more of this um, human specific <laughs> uh, interrogation of the underlying mm -hmm. biology for one thing. Um, and, you know, um, a, a continued commitment um, and one that, you know, now does have the ability to bring in some new modalities, you know, gene therapy and other things are being explored in the context of CNS diseases. And, you know, maybe with so, and, and antisense oligos are now approved for some <laughs> CNS diseases. So, you know, with a broader toolbox, perhaps some of these uh, challenging targets and challenging biology will finally yield. Um, uh, clearly, uh, the unmet need is is so astronomical that um, you know it, it's not a space that we can ignore. Um, you know, at, at Sanofi, I would say if we have kind of an emerging theme, it's kind of what I would call neuroinflammation, and the idea that there's an inflammatory component to many of these diseases, and maybe we can you know forestall the inevitable if we can uh, dial down the neuroinflammation as one of the as a you know a, a new strategy. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, a field that's not for the faint of heart, and it does require a, a, a long-term, uh, you know, perspective of, of yes. what the commitment will take. You know. Yeah, yeah, good points, John. Um, thoughts, Andy? Are you, are you hopeful? Well, you know me, I'm always hopeful. I'm a glass, whatever percent full it is. Always. But I, but I, I'm hearing kind of the hesitancy in John's voice. And, you know, I think it's the hardest nut to crack, you know, and I think that we've, you know, again, aducanumab aside, we can talk about that ad infinitum. I think it's just an area where the, the heterogeneity of the disease or lack of understanding or inability to easily correlate, readily correlate biomarkers with clinical endpoints and the, the likelihood that, the, the disease, the course of disease is, is ignited um, at a point that's very early in its natural history, perhaps before any symptoms emerge. And so that creates immense challenges in uh, understanding and studying potential medicines. We, you know, with all that said, we're all in, you know, we, yes. we, we're really keen. Our focus has been, you know, go, going back to something that Matai had brought up, which I think is a trend that follows the science is to try to go after the most targeted focused patient population that you can you know where possible defined by um you know human genetic etiology because i think yeah. you, there you have the greatest likelihood of understanding the pathophysiology and being able to intervene um, in a way that makes most sense and you, because you have the most homogeneous patient population you're likely to see the greatest effect sizes with your drugs so smaller trials that can more rapidly get you to endpoints yes it just makes complete sense to me, Andy, that that's the way that, you know, we will develop great medicines. But Matai, thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, I, I was just reflecting on the vaccine and the, the amount of time that companies spend talking uh, to one another, with one another, 
and sharing information and insights on endpoints and so forth. And, you know, there aren't that many diseases like Alzheimer's disease that look like that vaccine effort. It is, it is, it is a called arms kind of moment. There are many companies, you know, Takeda, for sure, Johnson Johnson, where we're, we're in, you know, we are committed and yes. there's a kind of a, an acceptance that it'll take a, a level of persistence that's high. But if you crack this nut, to use Andy's phrase, it's really big. It's really important. It's consistent with every one of our missions, right, in a, in a major way. It's societally incredibly impactful compared to most diseases. It's a, it's a profoundly impactful fact if you could do it. So there's plenty in it, in a sense, from a business sense, for multiple companies to, to work together. So it might be one of those, one of those rare situations where we really do want to work together. I don't mean like starting a fund and, and funding lots of different things, but I mean, take, take a few serious players that have long-term commitment and work together, like as if you're one, one company. And, uh, and that'll be what allows us to, to make sort of the investments needed to you know, probe the, the longitudinal histories of different uh, genetic uh, you know, bases um, you know, different environmental factors, potentially, it, it's too, I think, I feel like it's too hard for one company to go it alone. In this. No, I, I think you make a great point though, Matai, and I must say from my perspective, I see you guys collaborating way more than happened in the past, and I'm not saying it didn't happen in the past, but the concerted efforts that you folks have made over this last period are really quite profound. Does that make sense to you, Dave? Is that is that the way to go, Matai? Yeah. You know, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I'd like to pick up on that theme. There's no question that you know the public health importance can't be overstated. You know, there is a tsunami of cases of neurodegenerative diseases, primarily Alzheimer's disease, but others as well that are going to that's going to overwhelm societies around the world, driven simply by demographics. Uh, and so collectively, we bear an enormous responsibility to address that. Now, to me, the core challenge right now is our limited understanding of the fundamental disease processes. And that makes it hard to generate higher probability therapeutic hypotheses. So I really wonder if it's time for a, a moonshot approach, for mm. example, on something like Alzheimer's that puts together uh, the players who are involved, uh, knowing that the you know that it's going to be a, a long road, uh, but that any individual organization, as Matai is saying, is unlikely to crack this problem on its own. And so, do we conceive of some broader public-private type of partnership that really tries to tackle the problem? To me, that's the conversation worth having right now. Yes, and indeed. Yeah, can I well, jump in? Please, Natalia, yeah, I was going to call yeah, just on you. A, one, of, one of the thing there is, uh, you know, John mentioned uh, neuroinflammation, neuroimmunology. I do think that we have to look beyond the aggregates, the protein aggregates itself that we see as they are present in the disease. And, um, you know, that is where we're most interested in it, our all understanding as best we can sometimes internally, sometimes through collaboration, the processes that lead to that end result. And, um, you know, maybe it's the cleaning processes, it's the, it's the clearing out the system or degradation of, of bad actors that might lead to end-stage pathology. And I would, I would encourage all of us to also watch some of the, the newer measurements that are being made whether it's um, whether it's immune characterization methods, uh, whether it's single cell or other other uh, other methodologies for just characterizing the, the immune system that's present longitudinally and uh, establish correlates there. And I would also watch for different um, non-invasive measurements as well that uh, that may be good things to correlate the immunology to. Yes. And so it's just, it's just, it's, it, it, the more diverse our, our approach is, the better. And we can do that if we are part of a, of a collective rather than individuals. Yes. Yeah, but well, Marna, very quickly on, on this point, there, there's a fallacy that collaboration and competitiveness are in conflict with one another. 
And it's quite the opposite. In complex areas where we don't fundamentally understand the biology, like Alzheimer's disease, collaboration drives competitiveness. Yes, absolutely, Andy. And you've been very consistent with that for many years, and I couldn't agree more. As you also know, this, this panel has spawned many great initiatives in, in former years. And maybe we heard the day a semblance of something that could be built around neurodegeneration, taking those points. Don't miss that point, Karun. We will, uh, we will come back to it maybe when we're all together next year. I'm going to bring in Dr. Sharma now. Um, we have two uh, great guests with questions. So, Pooja, could you um, present your question, please? Thank you so much for this opportunity. So I just want to ask a small question. Since the new drug and clinical trial rules in 2019 and the resulting regulatory ease of work in India, creation of several GCP compliant clinical trial networks, uh, disease registries, tissue banks, a lot of data, positive public opinion around clinical research. India still is very poorly represented in global clinical trials or multi regional clinical trials, uh, especially that in early phases. Do you, what do you feel are the reasons for that and how can that actually be tackled or addressed? Thank you, um, Dr. Sharma. Great question. I'm going to ask the panelists to be brief because I'm going to bring in Karen Reeves next. So, Andy. Well, certainly huge progress in India um, over the past three to five years. When three to five years ago, we couldn't do anything in India because of prohibitive um, policies around IP. So certainly provisions have changed. We heard two years ago here at USAIC some of the um, progressive regulatory frameworks that are being put in place. But I'll say that from my perspective, there's, there's still steps that need to be taken. Um, it, the, if you just compare the regulatory environment in China to that of India, they're vastly separated. And you can see what, what's happened in China opening up the gates. And then secondly, and I'll just end here, the clinical trial infrastructure is still not at a point where at least my comfort, and I would guess it's the same for my colleagues here, I feel comfortable going broadly in India running clinical trials as part of global studies data management, data privacy issues, um, quality issues. There's still something that we need to work together to build in India. Very good, Andy. Thoughts, Dave? Yeah, I, I really agree with Andy. I think the regulatory component in, in particular uh, is quite important. Uh, and to the extent that you're able to effect policy, uh, you know, that is one area that, that I think does have to advance. But it's clearly, you know, progressed since three to five years ago, uh, uh, as Andy pointed out, but I think there's still still a little room to grow there. So if, Matai, David, if it was one area that you would like to highlight, what would that be? Matai, one area you would like to highlight? Yeah. It's, it's, it's definitely multifactorial though, so I don't know that that's a, that's a good way to answer the question. I am super impressed with the slope. You know, the, the rate of, of progress is, is extraordinary. Um, obviously, uh, there's now political will and there's um, protection of the core systems that are needed, like whether it's intellectual property, um, whether it's working on infrastructure, you know, all the different elements of what it is to do GCP at the end of the day, it's definitely coming together. And uh, we'll be one of the first in, like as soon as we see that threshold kind of, kind of reached. But there isn't, there isn't one overwhelming thing yep. from my, my perspective or my company's perspective. Yep. Anything from you, John, before we move on? I, I don't think you need to add that the uh, other panelists haven't already mentioned. Thank you. Dr. Sharma, thank you. Great thank question. You. Great question. You. Karen, uh, we've just got time to squeeze in your question. Karen Reed. Oh, so thank you, Martin. Uh, so here's my question. I think we can characterize the last year as the best of times and the worst of times. And building on the best of times, how do we actually accelerate the can-do results that we saw, the enthusiasm, the energy? How can we continue that, accelerate it, expedite it in three areas, research and development, policy, and regulatory? because there are many other diseases that we all face. Great question, Karen. Um, 30 second answers, please. John. 
You know, I think, uh, let's be just focus maybe on the R&D side. You mentioned three different areas, but I, you know, and I know from previous discussions with my colleagues here, uh, all of us who sit in big company land have learned a lot about how to be more agile, to push decision making down to the team level, to uh, be willing to take smart risks, um, you know, to, to, to work uh, r remotely in distributed decentralized clinical trials. So capturing these learnings, I think, is, is actually maybe the, the biggest silver lining of this whole uh, pandemic experience, because I think we've really realized there, there are better ways to work, and we're going to now institutionalize those as the go-forward process. <laughs> Terrific. Dave? Yeah, let me give a specific example. You know, the opportunity to really make rapid progress on what you might call the virtualization of clinical trials. So not bringing the patient to the site, but bringing the site and the trial to the patient uh, using a combination of digital technologies, uh, other technologies. We've, we've demonstrated that we can do that. We, we shouldn't regress. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, number one. Number two, I think that gives us another big opportunity, which would be the democratization of clinical trials to then reach patient populations who are not currently uh, well served. So to me, those are, those are two areas where we, we absolutely have the opportunity to capitalize going forward. Absolutely. Matai. Yeah, there's, there's maybe to, to pick up where David left off. I, th I think it is in the conduct of a clinical trial, um, whether it's, it's site initiation, you know, we believed we had to do it a particular way, um, or um, investigator meetings, we believed we had to get a whole bunch of people to fly somewhere and do it together. Or, it, you know, it's, it's the visiting of certain sites. We've been doing risk-based monitoring for a long time. But um, what does that actually mean and what's remote monitoring mean and how good can you have it if you can walk around with an iPad pretty effectively? And so there's all sorts of stuff that we just had beliefs were not um, going to be as robust or high quality that turned out to be just fine. So there's no way we should let ourselves um, retreat from that. And I know our clinical development operations group is thinking that way and is trying to reinforce certain things that we were doing over the last year and a half, uh, last year or so. Well, you've certainly been at the forefront with others, Matai, and I just, I just can't give you guys enough credit for the speed and the accuracy and the efficiency and the ultimate wonderful things that you and others have produced. It's really been marvelous. Andy, thoughts? I, I love the digitalization topics that Dave and Matai brought up. I think that's going to stick. But I'll, I'll go to an, a different area. I'll dial up much in the same way that John did, which is unconstrained thinking. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. We had a burning platform over the last year, and we saw amazing heroic efforts by many companies, Matai, yours included, to, to do things that we never thought was possible. Well, we have that same burning platform in every disease area that all of our companies are working in, and their patients who are dying, who don't we're not cared for and don't have therapies to treat their diseases. We have to remove the constraints that burden us. We're so comfortable failing in the ways that we felt that we failed for years and years and years, even you know, since you were a child in this business, Martin. Right? We're very comfortable with that. We accept those failure rates because people understand that. When you fail doing something new, it invokes a very different emotion that people are very afraid of. And I think we need to release those burdens. Yep. Great point, Sandy. What a wonderful place to, to end the panel. And as always, I'm just, I just think you guys are terrific. Great questions from Karen and Pooja. That was a really nice end to the, the session. And here's the great news. Next year, we're going to be together. We'll all be in the same room because of the advances made by your companies and other companies that will allow us to be human beings again and no doubt in Boston and having a lot of fun. With that, I want to thank everybody and I'll bring the panel to the end. Hand back to you, Karun. Thank or you. maybe to you, Andy. Oh, no, I'll come on. I need some time also on the screen. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Can you put the poll slide? And before that, uh, Martin, wonderful, on time. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, I think it's like an old, uh, you know, your scotch. It gets better and better every year, like a single mall from the highlands, right? 
So it's 14th year for you, 14 times. So you are there. So thanks a lot. So can you hear the poll slide, please? The question is beyond COVID, where do you expect mRNA technologies to have the biggest impact? Poll starts now, 60 seconds. Thank you. Everybody and welcome back. Before we jump into the last panel of the day, let's look at the answer to the most recent polling question. If we could please flash that up onto the screen so we can look at everybody, everybody responded. So the question was beyond COVID, where do you expect mRNA technologies to have the biggest impact? And we almost had a tie. And all of you believe that the biggest impact was likely to be in the areas of cancer vaccines and infectious disease vaccines. So thank you very much. 